everyone back. Um, this is going to be our second video for chapter 10. So remember back in part one, we had looked at um, basically the whole idea of classification. We talked a little bit about Aristotle, talked about Linnaeus, and then we talked quite a bit about how to create um, a scientific name and the different rules that apply to scientific naming. So in this second video, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the different ways that we might use to actually um, group different organisms together. Um, we're going to look at um, something called the phylogenetic tree. Uh, we're going to look at how to use a cladogram. And then at the very end, we're going to look at using a dichotomous key. So the basis for modern taxonomy, and remember taxonomy is that whole discipline of classification, is to basically look at different ways that we can group organisms. And the first thing that we might do is to look at structural similarities. In other words, look at the anatomy of the organisms that we are comparing to each other. And so if we had three different cats that we were looking at, and um, obviously we know that they're cats, but one thing that we would notice is that because they are cats, that all three of these organisms have something called retractable claws. And so that in itself would be a characteristic that would help us to group these animals together into one classification group. Um, even though the lion looks very different from the two cats that you see down here, because of that characteristic, we would keep them grouped together. The next thing we would look at um, possibly when we're comparing different organisms is um, the developmental stages that we might find um, for those particular organisms. And that could be something you could actually use to group them together. And so if you notice, um, down here in the lower left, we have a tadpole. And then over here in the right, we have a butterfly emerging from a cocoon. Now, the developmental process that is occurring for both of those is something called metamorphosis. And to metamorphosize simply means to change. And so, of course, we know that a frog or a toad, um, and salamanders as well, amphibians in general, usually have some sort of metamorphosis process that they go through to become that adult animal. And in this case, if you notice, we have an organism that sort of looks like a fish um, at this particular stage in its life. It is aquatic. It does not have legs. Um, it does have sort of a fin or a tail. So it resembles more of a fish as opposed to the adult form of a frog or a toad or a salamander. But through metamorphosis, over a period of weeks, that tail is going to be absorbed. The gills that it's using to breathe at this point are going to be absorbed. It's going to be able to breathe eventually atmospheric air, so it's going to develop lungs, and it's going to develop legs. And so over a period of time, it's going to metamorphosize or change into that adult form. And then, of course, we know that when you think about butterflies, this monarch butterfly that you see right here, um, most moths, butterflies, in fact, quite a few insects, go through metamorphosis. In other words, they start off in sort of a larval form. And in this case, we have an insect that starts off looking, well, like a worm. It's a caterpillar. So it's a, an elongated um, insect. It has many legs and it looks nothing like the butterfly that you see emerging from the cocoon here. Now, something to point out about um, these developmental stages is that not only do we compare it in this sense, but when you think about an evolutionary sense, and let's say you're comparing the fish, the reptile, the bird, and the human that you see down here towards the bottom, if you notice all four of these um, very, very early embryos look very, very similar to each other. And just because of that very reason, what we can infer is that all four of these organisms are related to each other. Now, when you put them into, and we're going to talk about this in a second, something called a phylogenetic tree, you're going to see sort of where you would position each of these different organisms within that tree, and you can see how closely related they are to each other. But simply looking at the developmental stage very early on in development, that gives us the clue, that gives us that information that we need to know that, you know, there probably is some sort of ancient common ancestor out there for every living thing that you see here on Earth. So another piece of um, evidence or information that we can use to classify organisms is something called biochemical genetic similarities. Now, when you talk about genetic similarities, you're talking about DNA. When you talk about biochemical similarities, you're talking about maybe amino acids and maybe larger proteins. 
Now I've given you two examples to think about on the screen. The one in the lower left is going to be um, cauliflower, cabbage, broccoli, and kale. And I put this one on there simply because if you do a genetic analysis of all four of these, and maybe that includes the wild mustard plant that you see in the middle, you would find that they have almost identical DNA sequences, which is very, very minute um, differences. But those minute differences are enough to give you all four of the different vegetables that we find in the grocery store. And the other example that I have here is not necessarily in a picture format, but it's more in a diagram. Because I want you to understand when you do a genetic analysis, what you're doing is you are simply looking at those four nitrogen bases and looking at the sequence that you would find those bases in when you do that genetic screening. And so for these four species, if you notice, the first three nitrogen bases, the adenine, the thymine, and the guanine, are exactly the same for all four. And then if you look at the next set of three, and usually again we look at them in groups of three, um, the guanine, the guanine, and the thymine, species one, two, and three, again, is exactly the same but you see a little bit of a deviation for species number four. And so you would just continue doing that. The more closely related two species are, the more similarities you're gonna find in the sequence of those nitrogen bases. So as I had mentioned at the very beginning of the video, um, one thing that we need to do for this particular video is to introduce or to review, some of you have seen these before, um, the whole idea of how to visually represent um, the classification scheme that we might come up with as we're comparing different um, living organisms. And something you might come across is something called a phylogenetic tree. And that's what you see on this screen. And all that simply is, is it's a tool that we can use to show the evolutionary history based on the taxonomy or the classification that we have come up with for those different organisms. And so it simply looks like a big tree. And at the base of that tree, and this is really important to understand, is gonna be that ancient common ancestor. And so in this case, the way that this tree is being represented, that would be the ancestral protista or single-celled organism that gave rise to everything that you see within this tree. So what I've done here is I've taken just a portion of that phylogenetic tree and I want you to take a really close look at how these organisms on this part of the tree are related to each other. And the important thing to realize here is that the closer the branches are to each other, the more related the organisms are to each other. And so if you look at sponges and you look at flatworms, because they are down here towards the bottom and they're closely um, positioned to each other on that tree, we would assume that they are more closely related to each other than let's say the sponge is to maybe the earthworm that you see in this part of the tree. So similar to what I had done back in the first video, I've kind of embedded some questions all right, throughout the, um, throughout the video. And so in this particular case, looking at this tree, the question is, who is the centipede's closest relative on this tree? And so again, take a second, find the centipedes, which is gonna be all the way up here, all right? And think about what would be its closest relative. Take a minute. All right, so when you think about centipedes, sometimes people will look at the position, or I, I would say the distance between the centipede and the spider, and they might infer incorrectly that centipedes are really closely related to spiders because they're so close to each other and they're at the top of the tree. I've even heard students say that. Uh, but what you want to pay attention to is you want to pay attention to this right here, and that's what we would call the node on a phylogenetic tree. And so that's basically where those two organisms or groups sort of deviated from each other in an evolutionary sense. And so since this node connects these two groups, the insects and the centipedes and millipedes, these two are actually more closely related to each other than a centipede would be to a spider. The node right here connects the spiders, all right, the arachnids, the spiders, that particular group, they're called chalicerates, to actually this group right here. So this would be actually considered a group in itself, the insects, the centipedes, and the millipedes. And so there's more distance between them in terms of an evolutionary sense. And so you really gotta pay attention to where those nodes are to see how closely related two groups are to each other.
And so again, this is just another representation of a phylogenetic tree. Um, the thing to kind of take away from this particular phylogenetic tree is that the further from the trunk of the tree, the more recently the organism evolved. And so if I was to let me try to do this here, if I was to put sort of a timeline here, and at the very top of our tree, I might put down the word recent, and maybe down towards the bottom, might use the word ancient, you could use the word older, that would be fine as well. But you sort of think about this timeline as you move further up in the tree, um, in terms of evolutionary history or time, um, this particular part of the tree becomes more recent. And so if you notice, sponges evolved before arthropods. And so again, on the left here, we find sponges and arthropods, which again is a really, really super large group that we're gonna look at, it's a really large phylum. Um, sponges actually evolved before because they're further down the tree, they're more ancient than the arthropods that you would see here. And so, like I did in the previous slide, which appeared first on Earth, echinoderms or mollusks. So I want you guys to again, pause for a second. Make sure you can find the echinoderms, which is this group right here, which includes starfish, sea urchins, sea cucumbers, and we have mollusks. So that would be things like squid and snails and clams. And so you want to think about, the question is asking, which appeared first on Earth? Well, again, mollusks are found right below echinoderms. So in the sense of this timeline that you see right here, echinoderms are more recent in evolutionary history than the mollusks. So another um, word that you're going to come across sometimes as you go through and you think about um, the whole idea of classification uh, of living organisms is a word called cladogram. Now, cladogram and a phylogenetic tree are kind of similar to each other. And if you look at the cladogram that is represented here, they kind of, it kind of looks the same as, as what we saw in the previous couple of slides. But for a cladogram, what you're trying to do is you're trying to show evolutionary relatedness by looking at shared characteristics. And so you're going to find here that not only do we have all of the different organisms sort of um, lined up towards the top, but we also have characteristics embedded within our cladogram. And we didn't do that with the phylogenetic trees. So an example of this would be both birds and crocodiles lay eggs with shells. And so the important part of this particular statement is right here, shells, and are therefore more related than either is to rodents. So the characteristic we're focusing on is eggs with shells. And this characteristic basically means that anything after that, so in this case, crocodiles and birds, these are related to each other because they both produce an egg with a shell. Now, if you compare rodents over here, all right, we know that a rodent is a mammal along with rabbits and primates. Um, they do not lay eggs with shells. Um, but they do produce eggs, we produce eggs. And the egg that we produce is considered an amniotic egg as is the eggs with shells that you would find in crocodiles and birds. And so down here is a characteristic that actually um, sort of groups a primate, a rodent, a crocodile, and a bird together. The difference is that this group has an egg with no shell and this group has eggs with shells. And so if you notice down here in the lower right, it says what characteristics are shared by both amphibians and primates. And so once again, pause for a second. Think about the question. We have amphibians and we have primates. And so what characteristics are shared by both amphibians and primates? And so looking at your cladogram, um, you can't use this, all right, because this characteristic actually comes after the line that you see here for amphibians but you would use the first characteristic before that, which in this case is four limbs. And if you look at the animals, of course, we know amphibians have four limbs, most of them, not all of them, but most of them. And of course, primates do. Both have a bony skeleton, so that would be the second shared characteristic. And the third, which actually is found in all of these organisms at the top of our cladogram, is that they have vertebrae. And so these three characteristics right here are shared by amphibians and primates. So the last thing I want to do is I want to give you a tool. And so it's a tool that if you go into taxonomy and you just really enjoy classifying things, it's a, it's a tool that you're going to use quite a bit. And it's something called a dichotomous key. 
And some of you might have used dichotomous keys before, and if you have, great, but if you haven't, it's a really super easy way to identify an organism. Most dichotomous keys are gonna give you two choices. And what you have to do is you have to look at the organism in question. So we'll look at number one here, and we have four different types of worms. Um, this is part of the key, all right, that you might use. And so the first two choices that we have here for number one is a worm has divided body parts. In other words, it's segmented. Or the worm is not divided and it's considered unsegmented. So if it is segmented, then it tells you to go to number three. So you are going to skip number two. All right. Now we're going to pick go to number three simply because if you look at the picture, it's easy to see that this worm definitely has segments. Now going down to number three again, you have two um, choices again. So the worm does not have spines. It has a saddle like portion or the worm has no saddle portion, but has spines. And so the saddle portion they're referring to is that part right there. And so in this case, it definitely has uh, a saddle that you notice. You can see it right there in this particular um, representative member of this organism. And then if you notice also, it does not have spines. And you can sort of compare it to number four because this worm right here definitely has spines. And so you would pick the first um, choice in number three. Now, when you get to the point where you have actually have a name, and it could be just a genus name, it could be genus species, it could be even be common names. Lumbricus, which is going to be the genus name for earthworms, then you're done. You've identified it. Um, if you come up to a number again, then you just follow the number uh, or you follow the instructions to the next number that you need to look at. And again, you look at those two choices. So you know that you're done with your um, classification of that organism once you have actually identified it and come up with that scientific name or part of that scientific name, or it could be a common name as well. So once again, this is just another example of a um, taxonomic key or a dichotomous key. Um, again, this one's for North American birds. Um, so if you notice here, uh, we could look at number one again. Um, in this case, they did give you some uh, measurements to work with as well because we start off with um, the size of the bird. And so in this case, we have two choices, larger or not larger than 40 centimeters. Since number one is definitely larger than 40 centimeters, you're gonna notice we're gonna go to number two. Um, hooked beak or the beak is not hooked. So you can definitely see right here, the beak is hooked. Um, and so since the beak is hooked, we go to number three. And this one says feathers over eyes that look like an ear. Um, or no feathers that look like ears. And so I think the feathers are referring to, if you compare it to number three here, is this right there. And so since this one does not have feathers that look like ears, um, this is a bald eagle, Haliaetius. Um, it looks like leucocephalus, all right? So this is gonna be the genus and species for that particular um, bird. Now I did throw this one in here simply because the two previous slides that you saw, that's typically how you represent a dichotomous key, but occasionally you'll come up with a key that looks like this. And it, it works exactly the same way, so, so don't get stressed out about it. Um, in this case, again, you look at the organism in question. Um, you're still given two choices um, in most cases. Um, but it does say two prominent ridges along the back, and then it says no ridges along the back for your second choice. And so the ridges that they're referring to are right there. And so this one you would say two prominent ridges along the back. Then you would come down, and again, you're given two choices, dark spots between the ridges or a mottled color. Um, in this case, you can definitely see that there are dark spots um, between those ridges. And so since we see those dark spots, it takes its town to, again, in this case, they give you both the scientific name and the common name of this particular type of frog. And so this has led us to the Southern Leopard Frog, Reina sphenocephala. All right. All right. So that's going to finish up um, part two of classification. And so as I told you in the first one, and we'll do this, of course, for every single video, please make sure that you have completed the, um, the study guide that I provided to you because, again, those are going to be your notes for, for this particular set of information.